Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a Building a Better Bend lecture. Um, I understand we have a full house, which is pretty exciting. And we'll be recording this lecture so that when, um, if you want to watch it again or tell your friends, the folks that maybe couldn't get on. My name is Karen Swirsky. I'm a board member for Building a Better Bend, which is a nonprofit group that was founded about 15 years ago. And our mission is to bring speakers to Bend who have experiences with development that might help us out and give us a, some positive ideas about a, how to affect the quality of, of, of de development in Bend. Um, for more information about Building a Better Bend, you should visit our newly revamped and totally awesome website at www.buildingabetterbend.org. Today, um, we are a sponsored uh, lecture series that we raise money per lecture. And today, um, I'd like to thank Pinnacle Architect for generously sponsoring this uh, lecture today. Um, some of you might remember way back in 2017, seems like a long time ago, when Dan Prolick first came to Bend and we had a full audience at the Tower Theater. Makes you nostalgic to think about that, doesn't it? Um, it was a great talk. It started a lot of conversation. So fast forward four years later, a few things have changed since then. For one thing, I now know how to correctly say Dan's last name. Um, which is kind of embarrassing considering that I was saying it wrong for four years, parolic. Um, the other thing that's really changed um, is that missing middle housing has become a widely used term. Um, it's, it's actually been adopted into, into law um, by the state of Oregon and by many cities. So part of our, our vocabulary. And then finally, Dan's written the definitive book that lays out the arguments for putting the missing middle back into our housing stock and more about that book in a minute. I wanted to talk just briefly about the, for any of those of you who are unfamiliar with the term missing middle housing, and there probably aren't very many of you out there, but it's a kind of neighborhood development that consists of appropriately scaled um, mostly multifamily housing, including things like duplexes and multiplexes and courtyards and townhomes. Um, they're called missing because uh, most of these types of neighborhoods haven't been around or were mostly built in the 40s and persist. And until recently, were actually illegal in many areas. And middle because they fill this gap between, between single family homes and mid to high rise apartments. I use the Broadway Villa apartments because um, for some reason, I just know a lot of people who spent part of their young adulthood living in this, in this housing, which is right in the middle of a residential neighborhood adjacent to some areas that have been converted to commercial. And it's the kind of housing that you literally could not build um, until recently um, anymore. So, um, Finally, um, I want to talk just briefly about uh, Dan and his book, Missing Middle Housing, which um, he's going to be talking about today. So Dan Prolix, an urban designer, an award-winning urban designer, just uh, announced some additional awards yesterday. He's an author and he's, he's the founding uh, principal of Opticus Design, which um, invented the term missing middle housing. Um, really, really um, innovative, a design firm, and I, I strongly suggest that you go to his website and look at some of the projects he's working on. It's just fascinating. Um, his work, his writing has been featured all over the place in many publications, and now he has put it all together in a really beautiful book called Missing Middle Housing, Thinking Big and Building Small to Respond to Today's Housing Crisis. It was ranked as one of the top 10 urban planning books of 2020. Um, we have provided copies of this book to all of our city councilors and planning commissioners, and we have one that um, is uh, exciting to you that uh, one of you have, has won a copy here today, and at the end of the lecture, we'll announce the name. Following this presentation, there's a chance for Dan to answer your questions. Please use the chat function um, to type in your questions, and we'll get through as many of them as we can. I know Dan really wants this to be interactive. 
So um, let's throw some hard ones at, at him. And I'm really looking forward to hearing his words of wisdom for Ben, and I hope you are too. And with that, Dan. Thank you, Karen. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a, it's a great pleasure to, I wish I was actually back in Bend, but it's, it's great to be back in Bend virtually um, after four years and, um, and, and hosted here by building a better Bend. And my, my, the focus of my presentation today is the, the top five mistakes to avoid when implementing missing metal housing. And I'll talk uh, specifically about those and why I think they're so important. But I do want to admit um, that you know, uh, over the course of the last four to five years, as I've been touring across the country, giving many presentations, uh, one of the highlights was definitely seeing my name on the Tower Theater marquee in downtown Bend. Um, just really exciting to see that. Um, and that was four years ago. You know, Karen mentioned that. Uh, it seems like a lifetime ago in many ways, but um, unfortunately, we haven't solved, I mean, unexpectedly, we haven't solved the missing middle housing puzzle. But um, what we have seen is that a lot has changed in a lot of cities uh, like Bend and others have, have made some really good progress and, and even states, um, obviously you're, you're well aware of that. And so it's, it's really great to, great to see that progress and, and really the adoption of the concept as, as, a, as a, a common best practice and a term that people referred to. And I don't you know, I don't have to talk about this in detail with you all because you're aware of it, the HB 2001, which was a groundbreaking uh, state housing bill that you're all now uh, in the rest of the cities in Oregon are implementing that enable a broader range of housing choices, including these missing middle choices um, in your communities. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to some questions and thoughts that come up from you all related to that and other efforts that you had in addressing this missing middle. Um, the unfortunate reality is in that past four years, in particular in the last two years, as right as um, the cost of materials have, have gone up, the cost of labor, cost of entitlement, the affordability um, in really every corner of the United States has only gotten worse. And um, the, the other unfortunate reality is uh, the, the COVID seems to have made, sort of put the fuel on the fire of uh, sort of a lot of the smaller communities as well in terms of affordability, uh, lack of affordability and attainability. And, you know, I have the statistic that 31% uh, of American households were housing cost burdened in 2017. And what I just saw in some additional research, which is really depressing to see, is that almost 50% of households that are renters across the United States are now housing cost burdened which means they're spending more than 30% of their income just on housing. And so like we're, we're really at a truly crisis level that um, we were starting to see four years ago, but it's definitely uh, just become a, a major, major issue. And you know what we're seeing is that um, the conversation in the last five years in particular has really shifted away from sort of the larger metros and some of the hotter markets like a Nashville or a Charlotte or a Denver to a lot of really small and medium-sized towns that most people have never even heard of, including myself. And just as an example, as you know, Boise, Idaho um, has been one of the hot and fastest growing markets in the country at the point sort of a, a year, year and a half, two years ago, when all of a sudden Boise uh, becomes unaffordable to many people. Some of the people that were living there are getting pushed out into other smaller communities throughout Idaho. And people that were moving to, to Boise from other markets are now looking at some of these other uh, you know, smaller towns uh, across Idaho. And uh, a large majority of our work actually has been in these smaller communities uh, like uh, Bozeman, Montana, or Missoula, Idaho Falls, Idaho where we've worked with them to identify where they should be prioritizing the application of missing middle housing and specifically identifying the barriers in their planning, zoning and policy that they need to remove to deliver it. Um, you know, uh, this is not um, too surprising either, but it's really become nearly impossible for builders to deliver single family homes at attainable price points in most markets. And what we've seen, and, and this is just an example from Missoula, and we've done this in a lot of other places, um, including in Bend, where um, developers are taking previously entitled single family uh, subdivisions or 
what's shown here is a traditional neighborhood development where they have been uh, entitled for single family homes and, and getting new entitlements to enable a broader range of missing middle housing types where the historically they were they were building and selling single family homes to to try to hit attainability in particular for um, entry level uh, house uh, home buyers. And so right even townhouses have become harder and harder to, to deliver at attainable price points. This is an example that I may have even shown four years ago or it was sort of um, <clears throat> even newly built or just uh, still on the boards uh, it's called the Muse Homes, what we designed um, for a builder in the Salt Lake City region to help them deliver attainable price points. And, <clears throat> excuse me, this was a very successful project. Our client was actually able to sell it at a starting price point of $190,000, and they hadn't been able to get anywhere near that $200,000 price point. And it was about $25,000 less than their just conventional tuck under a townhouse housing type. And, but the reality of the situation is just over the course of the last three years is that a, this one of these Muse homes that they could sell for 190, now due to these rising costs, they have to now uh, charge $230,000 for um, at, the, at the starting point. And so these have become unattainable. So it just asks the question of, well, what's the next missing metal type that needs to be introduced into these markets to deliver attainability? Uh, just it's really interesting and a little bit depressing to see the sort of escalation in prices. It's, you know, as Karen mentioned, it's really become not just part of the lexicon for planners and community members, but it's also become a part of the lexicon for builders and developers, both in the for sale and the for rent markets. Um, the study on the right titled Attainable Housing that I highly encourage you to, to pick up and look at. It was uh, created by ULI's Terwilliger Center in collaboration with RCL Co. Um, identified missing middle housing as one of the top three priorities and strategies for delivering um, attainable housing choices. And publications like Professional Builder are, are just continuously starting to highlight um, uh, missing middle project types and sort of help address the challenges that developers are facing in delivering them. So the other great thing that's happened over the course of the last three to four years is that um, AARP, you know, an organization with uh, you know 40 plus million members have become one of the biggest proponents of missing middle housing that's become a core part of their uh, livable community strategy and they were actually one of the funding sources for my missing middle housing book and part of the reason it was able to be printed in full color. Um, and community groups, you know, this is pretty cool to see they're 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 per latching onto the idea and personalizing it and helping utilizing the missing middle concept to help build support for the much needed housing choices um, in their individual communities. And as, as Karen mentioned, um, I finally was able to carve out some time um, and, and write the book that I'd been uh, talking about for about five years. And um, I, I just really liked this photo that Karen shared with me that even Pixel, who's Karen's cat and a, a resident of, of Bend, sort of is appreciating the book here as Karen unpacked the books and got them ready to deliver to the planning commissioners and city council members of, of Bend. So um, just as a starting point, before I dive into the um, mistakes, I do wanna make, just give a, uh, I know you're probably all at a 200 or 300 level understanding of Mr. Mendel, but I always wanna make sure that we're all, we all have the same understanding of, of, of what I mean by missing metal in terms of a couple of the most important element aspects and characteristics of it. And so um, I always like to start with this, this definition, even at a 200 or 300 level discussion and presentation that missing metal housing are house scale buildings. And that's really, really important. And I will emphasize this throughout my presentation with multiple units in walkable neighborhoods and that, that house scale is an element that's often forgotten. And I'll explain why that's important throughout the course of this presentation today. So, um, right, one of the primary objectives of missing middle housing is not just to deliver more housing and, and to enable more housing on a lot, but to deliver more housing in those choices in a way that delivers a, a good and a predictable form in that house scale. Um, so uh, I, once again, it's just really important. If you're gonna take away one concept from the presentation today is this term house scale and how important that is to the application and implementation of missing middle housing. And so 
Um, I think you all know this, why we call it missing, but this is a, a graph that I created for the book, uh, doing some research of the American Housing Survey data that just really clearly, clearly shows that since the late 1970s and into the early 80s, there was just a really dramatic decrease in the percentage of housing that was delivered every year being missing metal housing. And it just is a, a very steady decline, unfortunately, and it's only gotten worse in the last five to 10 years um, in terms of uh, why we call it missing. And it sort of led up to a lot of these issues. And you know, I could talk for, we could have a discussion about three or four hours or an entire symposium on just the barriers. And um, you know, uh, I finally got a chance when I wrote the book to sit down and research the barriers. And there's an entire chapter on barriers if you are interested. And so, right, so the S, sorry, HB 2001 removes the first of these barriers, but there's a lot of others that still are in the way for the delivery of missing metal, starting with the question about, well, who's who's going to deliver these these housing types that is that are important part of the conversation. And I the the reason, and I'm going to say that. Um, about 90% of the content of this presentation today is actually new, and I've been thinking about this over the course of the last six to nine months in particular, and starting to get worried that as the momentum has grown and there's been progress by cities and states uh, to enable um, missing middle and more, more units on a lot that we may be, and I'm seeing that we're making some of the same mistakes that we made in the 1970s when we sort of ratcheted up the zoning and got some pretty bad built results that like these that you see, like the Dean Bad, bad Apartment on the left and the, the Mansard Roof uh, apartment buildings that you see on the right that really caused a knee jerk reaction in, in most communities. In a lot of communities, it was the, the precedent for why historic districts were established in other cities, including my home city here in Berkeley, the zoning basically got, um, everything got re-down zoned back to only allowing single family zoning just based on the, 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 the really bad results that that, that effort um, resulted in. And I'm a little bit afraid that if we're not thoughtful about this, that there's gonna be some really bad results delivered that are gonna really impact the progress that we've made in the missing middle housing discussion. That's why I've, I've, I've really shifted to, to discussing some of the mistakes that I'm hoping uh, cities and even states as they're looking at this can avoid. And the first of the mistakes um, that I'm seeing sort of pretty regularly um, is that whatever cities are doing in terms of refining their zoning, um, refining their policy, is that they're allowing types that do not deliver attainability and are, are bad neighbors in terms of form and scale. And so I think the biggest of the offenders um, of these housing types that we're seeing delivered in a lot of different markets. And this is really what most of the development community will default to um, for a variety of different reasons that we can discuss. If, if you allow it is what we call a slot home. And this is, is a, a group of townhouses that you see on the yellow here that are oriented perpendicular to the street. And they basically are just extruded from the front setback to the rear setback. And um, these are not good for two reasons. Number one, we're seeing that where they're being delivered, they're not delivering attainable price points, right? They're still delivering price points that are unattainable to, to majority of households, even the middle income. And they're just bad urban, urban form. And um, you know the diagram doesn't really do the justice. So I always like to show some photographs. And um, right, this is an example of a slot home. You know, it's just extruded from front, front setback to rear setback. This cavernous um, space in between the units that's not really usable for anything whatsoever. It's just simply accessing your house. Bad frontage, and just really, it's it's not that house scale that I, I talked about earlier as an important part of the definition. They're not good neighbors. You can imagine that third story a unit at the rear of that lot just peers down into all of the backyards of the units around it. And so you just need to be really, really careful about where these are allowed and if these are allowed with your, when you're making adjustments to your zoning regulations. And I mean, these have gotten so bad. If you just Google slot homes, Denver, you see there was a two year uh, saga in Denver sort of battling the, the delivery of these in neighborhoods throughout Denver. And they ultimately made zoning changes to make them not um, allowed any further. But now we're seeing in places like Cleveland, Ohio, there was just an article I was interviewed for about slot homes because there's been a, a sort of pushback. And then even places like Houston, 
where I was uh, supposed to give a, a missing a walking tour uh, just as, pro as COVID was hitting and just saw a lot of these really bad housing types compromising uh, walkable urban neighborhoods near downtown in, in Houston even. So you can see why uh, people don't like these. Um, it just takes a couple of photo examples to, to demonstrate why you should consider not allowing these in particular in infill conditions. And maybe there's some places in sort of larger projects or in new communities that you might want to allow these and be thoughtful about where you allow them. But in infill, definitely not in. You know, even good architecture cannot mitigate the scale of these. This is actually a project uh, down the street from me. You know, the architecture generally is is pretty good, but the building type is just really out of scale, and it's just that extruded slot home townhouse. Um, the second type that we see that um, just encouraging cities to be really thoughtful about allowing is multiple full size single family homes on one lot, and um, right for the same reasons as the slot home is not really that good. It's it's that they don't deliver attainability. Um, this is just an example, and you could sort of calibrate. This isn't a really high value market here in the Bay Area, but you could calibrate it. For example, I'm seeing like a, a builder might buy a five or six or seven hundred thousand dollar bungalow, tear it down, and build four um, single family Tuscany homes on the lot and sell them each for more than what that original house cost. And so it, it's not not delivering attainability, and it also has the same issues with. Uh, just a lot of a, a bad form and um, not high quality spaces. And so we just encourage just to be thoughtful about allowing, and it's a very, very different solution than a, a bungalow court or cottage court that has been built historically. I'll talk about that. And then there's tall, what we call tall skinnies. And, um, you know, just need to be thoughtful. I actually really like the architecture of these, but it's just a really, um, a bit of an unusual and an odd type. It's just like how, how small of a lot can you fit a single family home on is really the exercise here. And um, you just need to, once again, like in some contexts, this might be okay. You just need to be thoughtful about where you want to allow it because this type of fee simple um, detached house is really what most builders will be most comfortable building. And that's likely what you'll get unless you regulate against it. So just, just being really thoughtful about what you want and, and how to get what you want with through your regulations. So the second mistake is, is treating the number of units per lot the same as a housing type. And this is a little bit hard for some people to get their hand, hand, heads around, and um, I can understand why, but even a lot of planners really have a hard time understanding this. But each of the housing types, I, I guess part of my missing middle push uh, in one of my messages as of recent is that we all need to become knowledgeable about the characteristics of the physical form of this broad range of missing middle housing types and the terminology, what they're calling them. Because um, each of these housing types, like when I say fourplex, for example, in my mind has a very intended built form. It's not just about enabling any four units on a lot, it's about enabling four units in a specific form. So I think that's a really, really important part of what we need to be thinking about when we discuss and, and implement missing middle. And just that fourplex as an example of just needing to clearly define what a fourplex is and is not. So to us, and as I was writing the book as well, we, we refined some of the names of these types to be a little bit clear. So we, what we historically called a fourplex, we now call a fourplex stacked. It's this type that um, I know I saw in Bend. I see it in every, pretty much every neighborhood that I tour when I'm, when I'm either working in different cities or traveling. It's this two units on the ground floor and two units stacked above it. And this is house scale, right? It only goes a certain depth into the lot and it, it delivers at house scale and delivers the four units. And this is, this is really important. When we talk about fourplex, uh, in terms of the fourplex stacked, this is a type that we need to be talking about and thinking about and, and regulating, writing a set of regulations that deliver this type. And right, there's just a lot of data that we've generated through research that's on the Missing Middle website at missingmiddlehousing.com, as well as now in my book, where we've recorded sort of the numeric parameters. Uh, we've shown sort of the smallest typical lot size that these types can fit on. And we ideally, we just wanted, um, planning efforts to utilize this information to help inform decision-making about regulations and policy uh, to, to effectively implement missing middle. 
And so um, just wanted to show you a couple examples of sort of what we see often as, as being called a fourplex, but what is really just four units on a lot and should be called something different just to just for clarity's sake and for conversation's sake, right? Four townhouses in a row. Um, this is a good missing middle type, uh, belongs a lot of places. I know even some of the uh, newer, uh, new urbanist communities like Discovery West implemented just this basic townhouse, but I just wanna encourage you to call this a townhouse. Maybe you can call it a four run townhouse or four unit townhouse, but, but don't call this a fourplex. It's, it's actually a different type. And I just, just for clarity's sake and, and what the expectations are. And even more importantly, um, this is a, a big mistake we're seeing is that um, new zone, newly written zoning codes, um, newly written policies are including four single family detached homes on a lot in a fourplex classification. And I, I feel very, very strongly that this is a really bad idea. Um, first of all, because it generates a very different form than our fourplex stacked. I feel like we're, you, you might build support in a community for the implementation of that fourplex stacked. Um, you, it's gonna be harder to build support for this sort of single family detached uh, homes on a lot, which you know sometimes we call it a house cluster. It's not really a type. Um, and you can see like when it's the exception like this on a lot, like, okay, well, maybe it's not so bad, but you can imagine over the course of 25 or 30 years of, of each of those homes or maybe duplexes being replaced by these um, four units per lot, it, it starts to really impact the way you experience the neighborhood and the character and quality of it. And so this is just kind of one of the big yellow flags I'm waving. Um, in my missing middle discussions, just to be really thoughtful about if you actually want to allow this, because this isn't going to deliver, as I mentioned earlier, attainable housing. It's still going to deliver at the very high end of the price points. And it's, to me, it's just not good urban form. Um, and then the duplex. Um, this is, it's really important, like, right, it's not just about two units on a lot, but it's about, hey, there's a certain format that the different duplex types have historically come in that we should be clear about what we're talking about. And so we've actually, right, we, we've classified different types of duplexes um, through our research and over the course of the last 10, 15, 20 years. So we have a side-by-side -side duplex, which is, you know, you could even say single story or double story, like it might make a difference. The stacked duplex, which you see in the middle, which is a uh, you know, one of my favorite types. And then there's a different version of the stack duplex on the right, which, you know, may have actually just been a taller Victorian home that actually integrated a, a, a second unit on that tall ground floor. And so I think it's just really important to, you know, just think about what is the form we're talking about rather than just, we're thinking about two units in any format um, when we're talking about a duplex. And an important part of this house scale with all of these types, including the duplex, is that it does protect some of that rear yard space. And I actually think that's the, a really important part of the, the built environment. Um, not that we all need huge backyards, but we need to be thoughtful about, you know, not taking up every square inch of, of a site and leaving no uh, high quality shared space or private space on those lots. And so, you know, when we were working in Austin, Texas, um, on the zoning code update uh, several years ago, you know, this duplex kept coming up as, you know, people were, were willing to accept like this kind of a duplex, which historically delivered attainability um, in their homes. But the reality of the situation was, um, you know, their zoning code actually at some point in the recent past had enabled two units per lot. It actually called it a duplex, but it was really just two units per lot. And I'm going to say that these pictures don't actually make this look as, as sort of awkward as it actually was in person when you start to get a bunch of these on a lot and the, you know, the architecture is actually not, not bad. But what they started getting is a full-size house in the front of the lot and then a full-size house in the rear of the lot. Once again, not delivering attainability in what I would consider not great urban form. And then there's this discussion about architecture as well that comes into the discussion about, well, is, is there a certain preference or, or, or can you regulate it or what, what do you want to regulate? And we're, we're kind of battling with that in the state of California here with integration of the requirement for objective design standards um, that the state is now requiring for 
residential uses and we're able to be really thoughtful in the zoning we're writing, but we're even in some communities that still want to retain their architectural uh, standards to make sure that they are objective as well. Um, and I just, one last point I wanna make on this mistake is that a building type is, is not an allowed use. It's a desired form. And so that sort of reinforces some of the mistakes we're seeing, but that's really, really important to differentiate if you can't just put this a duplex, fourplex in your allowed use table and assume that the outcome and the form is going to be predictable and kind of what you want. So that's just a really important part of that. So the next mistake um, that we see, and this is, you know, this is part, this is like version 2.0 or 3.0 of missing middle application in terms of it's great that we've made progress. It's great that we're enabling this, but we need to step back and instead of you know, replicating um, sort of the, 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 the efforts and progress that an HB 2001 made or that the city of Minneapolis made and say, well, how can we do it even better the next time around? And, and one of the ways I think we can do it better is instead of limiting the number of units per lot, that just be really specific about regulating a desired form and allowing um, a broader range of unit sizes within that desired form. Because if you limit the number of units it, on a lot, it has the same issue that density-based zoning has is that it disincentivizes the delivery of smaller, more affordable units. They're actually what, what is really most needed. And so this is just, this is a diagram, a series of diagrams that I created for the book that I finally got a chance to work with my team here at Opticos. But it just simply demonstrates, sorry, on the upper left here, it's just, this is a single family home on a 125 foot deep by 50 foot lot. The exact same building footprint on that exact same lot just split into a duplex, right? Um, you know, very easily can be done. And obviously the, the duplex units are a little bit smaller than that single family home. Then the idea here is, well, within that exact same form, sure, let's let's allow, the, the, the developer builder to, to do four units. And those four units with, with that exact same envelope would just be a little bit smaller and a little bit more affordable. And hey, while we're at it, which is what most of the efforts are missing here is, well, why not if we clearly define that allowed form in that maximum size of building, why not let the, the, the builder deliver eight studio apartments in that exact same building size so that it can deliver another choice and even a broader range of attainability. And I think this is sort of the next evolution of missing middle application because this is the type of incentive that is uh, needed to deliver, you know, these types of missing middle housing types that are so highly valued and desired. And I will say that the way that most efforts are going, it's sort of pushing for larger uh, two, three-story buildings. And so we're not going to get these great little missing middle cottage courts and housing types that I think are an important part of the need for choice. Um, and one solution, just to be thinking about this, is to calculate any unit under a certain size, like 750 or 1,000 square feet, as half a unit, um, so that you can actually put more small units on a lot, and you're you're incentivizing that. Um, this is this is actually an example of a really great cottage court by our colleagues at Union Studio. Um, that's one of the case studies in the book that I just encourage you to take a look at. It's an in infill project in a small town downtown. Um, the fourth mistake is uh, not effectively regulating form and scale to get this house scale. Um, and I just want to emphasize, once again, this is a new diagram that we created for the book that it's not just height that matters, but it's the maximum height a maximum width along the street edge and a maximum depth of building that are all super important for delivering this house scale. And there's very, very few cities that are doing this. And, um, you know, just back to the image, house scale, three units, house scale. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna continue to beat you over the head with this. So why, you know, why would you regulate a maximum building depth versus just, you know, using a rear setback? That's the question that always comes up in, in almost immediately for most zoning code writers and planners. And the reason that you, you regulate maximum building depth is because it delivers a more predictable form because we all know, especially in sort of the older neighborhoods, there's just irregular lot patterns. So what you see on the left is where, hey, the, the lot on the left 
just ended up being a little bit deeper because it's on the end of the block than the, the lot next to it. So if you use a rear setback, a building that's a lot deeper and, and really at a scale to the one next to it is allowed as opposed to the version on the right where if you're using a maximum building footprint, even when the lot gets deeper, it can more predictably deliver that L scale form. And so then the question is, well, why would you regulate maximum building width rather than just rely on the setbacks, the side setbacks to deliver that? Well, once again, if, if an adjacent lot is wider than like, let's say a typical lot pattern is 50, but there just happens to be a hundred foot wide lot, and you can actually build a building with five foot setbacks, you're gonna get a, a building that's beyond this house scale. And instead of just encouraging or regulating for the delivery of multiple house scale buildings on that lot. And it also discourages the aggregation of lots, which uh, I know is most communities are really happy to hear about. And granted, there are some exceptions. This is a great, um, I think it's a 12 plex building in, in Midtown Sacramento that I just like to use an example. It's a little bit wider than what we might typically um, encourage, but it's a great type and it fits really nicely into a neighborhood that's mostly single family. And then just, just encourage cities to ask the questions like, do you want to allow that third floor? Um, and the, the nuanced approach basically that, that we often take is that you would allow that third floor in some places with a different zoning district where you, in a different place than you might allow just the two stories or the two and a half stories with a different zoning district. And I think just, I'm just encouraging cities to be real really thoughtful about that third floor because it does really make a tremendous amount of difference in the way that you perceive the scale of the buildings. It sort of go bump, bumps up immediately beyond that house scale that we talked about. And to, to address this, because we do know there's a need for those three and four story buildings that are deeper. So we started, we've created the second category called upper missing middle housing and say, well, most cities need both this core missing middle and this upper missing middle, but we shouldn't confuse them because they're likely going to want to be allowed in different places. And then the last of the mistakes, and I know um, most cities are having robust and uh, sort of heated debates about parking, and, and Karen asked um, me to talk a little bit about parking because I think she had, I'm sure some of you had sort of gone to a recent presentation by Tony Perez, um, in our office that he did for the state of Oregon. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about, about this. Um, you know, one of the questions that I just like to ask is for a city is like, would you rather have an affordable housing problem or a potential parking problem? Um, just a, I just find that an interesting question to, and discussion point uh, sort of among community members because most of them are absolutely dealing with an affordability, really a crisis at this point. Um, but, you know, a lot of community members are worried about, well, well is there going to be a parking problem if we reduce parking requirements? And um, if any of you are Banksy fans, um, this is one of my favorite Banksy uh, street, street murals. Uh, this is in LA. And it, what, what I like about it is it just like, to me, it's like I use it a lot to encourage communities to just sort of step outside of their comfort zone and just get really creative about talking about the need to, to reduce parking barriers to enable the delivery of missing middle housing. And like I, I, some of the other messages, right, we've done a much better job providing spaces for cars than spaces for people. You see that in every city, there's lots of sort of half used parking lots sprinkled throughout towns. And you really cannot be sort of supportive of attainable or affordable housing in your community, but also be pushing for high off street parking requirements. It's just, just not, it's just, it's just a disconnect. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit of a second. The two primary issues related to parking as a barrier for missing middle is number one, the physical constraints, um, especially on small to medium sized lots, especially in existing neighborhoods, you really can't fit a lot of these great missing middle housing types on those lots as well as fit parking on. And second of all, right, even if you can fit the parking on, it usually reduces the amount of number of units or square footage of leasable or sellable um, space that you can deliver. So it often makes the projects infeasible uh, from a development standpoint. And so we've done a lot of studies, and I just encourage you to look at some of these in the book that have just shown the impact in terms of the physical limitations of, you know, the amount of parking you can be requiring. And I mean, I'm a I mean, I'm just be really frank. I'm a big proponent of 
of cities removing their parking and letting market sort of drive this. Um, but in most cities that we're working in, if you require more than one off street parking space per unit, um, it's either number one, either impossible to fit these good types on the sites, the lots, the existing sizes of lots, or it just makes it infeasible from a pro forma standpoint. So, um, and then there, this is the work we did with uh, Fred Gaze and Associates when we were writing the Austin Zoning Code. We just, we thought this was really, really relevant to ground the conversation to really show the impact of the cost of providing parking on either the rent, um, uh, or we also did this for for sale um, sort of housing prices. But you can see that jumping from a one space uh, per unit uh, where a project sort of ran the, they ran the pro form analysis and showed that the, the average month, monthly rent that would be necessary was about $900. That average monthly rent jumps up, if you require two spaces, up to $1,400. And so, right, it becomes much less attainable for a pretty large percentage of, of residents of the community. And so there, there is some, you know, to Joe Minicosi's point, uh, do the math, just encourage you to run this pro forma analysis to study that understand that impact of parking and you know just some of the, some examples that we're seeing in different contexts um, I just like to show this this is a missing middle neighborhood um, that we were just starting when we last spoke in Ben that now has over several hundred units built it's in the Omaha Nebraska metro it's called bungalows on the lake or prairie queen I, I didn't pick the name um, uh, but this project um, it's all multifamily, it's all rental, and it ranges from duplex to eightplex that's laid out in a street block format, looking like the neighborhood. Um, and then there's this little neighborhood main street that we could, I can ask questions about. But the key to this project was that we were, we designed this and our client was comfortable with this with one off street parking space per unit. And then the on street parking being used to uh, deliver the rest of the needed parking for the residents. And it has had no impact on the viability or the interest from renters in this project. Actually, there's uh, that these these units are all rented sort of months prior to being um, completed. Um, every single one of them has, and our client just charges extra for the garage spaces. So, if somebody that can actually pay a little bit of extra and wants that garage space, does it. And so, because this has proven to be viable in such a suburban location, like to me, it's just an example that one street. One off-street parking space per unit should just be a real cap, especially when you're thinking about more infill context and even more walkable cons. Just give you a sense of on the right is a five plaque, on the upper left is a four plex, and on the lower left is a live working unit with ground floor flex space. So the other exciting project we're working on is um, will be the largest car-free community in the United States. And the vertical construction starts in June of this year, just in a couple of months. It's called Cul-de-Sac Tempe. And once again, I didn't name the project called this act is actually the name of our, our client and the developer. And it's a little bit of a ironic name, obviously. And what's, what's exciting about this is that there's just so much demand for this that our client is just no way going to be able to keep up. So for the first 130 units in the first phase, there's 150 renters that have put deposits down and there are 3,000 uh, People on a waiting list for the for the upcoming phases, and this is in Tempe, Arizona, right? The sort of one of the epicenters of car culture, and I there's people moving from across the country to live in this car-free environment, and I just you know I feel like if there, there's a tremendous pent up demand for this car light and car-free living, that missing middle can be play a really important role in delivering. And another great aspect of a project like this is because we were able to remove the car spaces for the car that. 60% of the space in this project is public space. Uh, it's courtyards, it's plazas, it's small paseos. And it's just, it's just exciting to see the strong demand for this. And just as a personal example, um, I live in a neighborhood in Northwest Berkeley. If you know Berkeley, it's down in the flats. 90% um, of the homes on my street park, park on the street. Um, it doesn't impact the value of the homes. It doesn't impact the quality of life. And, it, and what it has done is it enabled a lot of these homes to expand to meet, meet, meet their household needs as they grow. And I'm going to say this, and I'm off the record, even my garage there on the lower right um, has been, I sort of chopped my garage in half and I built uh, in sort of an AD, uh, uh, sorry, a guest suite in a lower level of 
my house and left just enough space to park my bikes in the garage space. And so this is a neighborhood that has about 20% missing metal. I think there's just a lot of great examples that show this is viable. We need to address this to truly enable missing metal housing. And a few concluding thoughts. Um, I'm encouraging cities across the country uh, to look at local adjustments to the the residential building code, because one of the big barriers is that after the three units that the buildings jump from the residential code, excuse me, to the international building code, and there's huge cost implications in doing that and just complex other complexities. So I know like the city of Memphis that we've done a lot of planning work with, including their general plan, comprehensive plan update that included a core of missing middle is working with their building department to adjust that um, uh, have a local adaptation of the residential code to allow up to four units, which I think is gonna be a, a tremendous precedent and go a long way. Um, one of the other sort of reference points I just encourage everybody to look at, it's a great document that we did the research for, for NHB, the National Association of Home Builders, where we analyzed, I think 15 different case studies of zoning and development projects at the missing middle scale across the country. Um, with that, I just want to thank you. I look forward to the discussions and questions. Um, if you are interested in the Missing Middle book, I first encourage you to go to your local bookstore and order it from them. But if you can't get it from them, uh, you can either get it on missingmiddlehousing.com or Island Press. Uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter or hook up with me on LinkedIn if you want to just uh, have an ongoing conversation about Missing Middle. And you know, just as a closing thought, um, you know, it's, it's amazing that four years have gone by. As I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, there, and Karen mentioned, there has been tremendous progress on the front of, of enabling and implementing this in the middle. I, I'm hoping that, you know, in another four years and in 2025, I can, I can come back to Bend and we can, we can see a tremendous amount of great progress on this missing middle front and, and discuss good projects and bad projects and adjustments that were made and just continue to adapt and, and deliver these much needed housing choices. Thank you. Dan, that was great. That was everything, everything I hoped and more. And um, I have way more questions than we're gonna have time to get to. Um, because I'm the moderator and I can choose, um, I have a couple of questions around parking, um, because as I, as I warned you, it's a hot topic here in Bend. Um, so you showed a couple of examples of projects where there's very little or no parking, but those are kind of greenfield projects that are not uh, surrounded by existing uh, development. So how do you um, deal with the concerns about um, impacts on adjacent neighborhoods and neighbors, so of using on-street parking. And then related to that, in those areas, what's the role of public transportation and the ability of these projects to diminish or eliminate parking needs? First of all, I feel like I, the reason I used a couple of those greenfield examples is because I, my point is if it's, if it's viable, in a greenfield context, it's even more viable and desirable in an infill context. Sorry if I wasn't clear about that. That's that's part of the point I wanted to make. And um, I feel very strongly that um, you can actually create even more compatible projects by removing the parking from the design of the projects. And as an architect, I, I know that from firsthand experience. And those examples that I showed you of the slot homes um, are really driven by the accommodation of a lot of parking on the ground floor. And so it lifts up, right? It lifts up the buildings and makes them three stories, makes them tower over um, the, the neighboring pro properties. Um, and it gets away from that house scale. Um, it's, it's really hard to accommodate this house scale and, and accommodate a lot of parking. It's actually nearly impossible in infill conditions. And so I kind of feel like, um, it's actually in the best interest of communities that are most interested in, you know, just reinforcing and enhancing their, their character and the quality of their built environment to actually become supportive of fewer parking requirements. Otherwise, it will drive projects that are, are out of scale on those infill sites. And um, in terms of the role of transit, um, you know, I, I actually feel like if you had asked me this question two years ago or three years ago, I would say, yeah, you kind of need bus service or you need a light rail station. 
But what we're seeing now is that there's just more and more people that are interested in like using a bike, right? You know, 20 or 30 percent of the time of getting to and from places, especially in a place like, you know, downtown Bend and the adjacent neighborhood that have an interconnected street network that's, you know, bike friendly. Um, and so I, I feel it's actually less. And, and then in addition, right, technology, you know, where we you can it can deliver you a, a car to pick you up regardless of where you're at with Ubers and Lyfts and, and others. So I think just, uh, and I don't know if you have bike share and scooter share and Bend yet, but that also sort of opens up uh, possibilities and um, as well as car share. Um, but but even outside of those of community, first of all, I encourage communities to actually get car share if they don't have it, um, because I think that really helps. But even outside of that, there is a large percentage of US households and in particular, what we're seeing is, is millennials, but even boomers um, that, you know, they just want to live either car light, you know, they may not want to get rid of their car completely, but they want to live in a place, in an environment where they use their car less, or in some instances, they actually can, can live a lifestyle without the car. And so um, I think transit is less important. I think it becomes just even, even a, more of a plus if there is transit viable. But I think with today's access to mobility choices, it's, it's less important. We had ride share and we're working really hard to bring it back. So uh, um, another question about, um, oh wait, I forgot. First thing I need to do is announce who won the book. Cause that, Yay. or maybe I should wait till the end. So we draw it out. <laughs> um, so Elizabeth Lafleur from the city planning department is our winner and Elizabeth, oh. uh, Valerie will be getting in touch with you and telling you how to um, get the book. So, Karen, I just want to let you know I can stay a little bit later because I did talk a little bit longer than expected, which is not unusual. But I can stay a little bit longer if if people want quotes to, to answer us to answer a few more questions. Valerie, does that work with our Zoom? Can we stay on a little longer? Yes, we should be good. Okay. All right. Well, we'll stay until until people drop off. Um, uh, so um, actually a question from Elizabeth as, as appropriate since she's our book owner about um, the effect of historic preservation districts on implementing missing middle housing. Do you have anything that you can share with us on that topic? Yeah, I mean, we, um, we've we been dealing with historic districts and a lot of our zoning code rewrites for the past 12 years. You can imagine a place like Cincinnati, there's a, there's a lot of really great amazing historic districts. And um, what we find with historic, um, whether guidelines or standards, usually guidelines, is that there's two pieces. There are the site planning related and amassing standards. And then there's more of the historic standards related to materials and window types, more architectural elements. And what we find is that, number one, you know, an approach that thinks about missing middle is very applicable to most of these historic districts because most of them have these types in it already. Um, if you, if we, we usually will take a more form-based approach and just make sure that those site planning standards are not in conflict with the existing zoning standards and sort of make sure that they're also going to deliver a predictable form that's desired and has been desired by the intent of that historic district. And then the more of the architectural standards um, they're usually pretty good and sort of are stay in place and don't have a lot of refinements. We, we like to make them as objective as possible, I guess, is, is usually the approach. But I think that there's not a conflict. Actually, we've been doing a lot of speaking about the role of form-based zoning in historic districts, and, and it's very compatible. Uh, Tony in particular, which you, Karen, heard a few weeks ago has spoken at several historic preservation co conferences about missing middle and form based zoning and, and how they're actually uh, a good, very compatible and sort of very, very much share the same intent. So I just, I think it's, I think there's not a conflict. I think it's, it's definitely a, a shared uh, a objective between these discussions. Well, I think you led me into one of the other questions that I think you may have answered it, which is your opinion of form based code as opposed to standard Euclidean zoning. Um, I think I know your answer, but um, what is your opinion? Well, first of all, like I, I tell people that I'm not 
I'm not caught up in what you want to call your zoning. Like I wrote a book on form-based coding, but I'm not going to say every city needs to call it that because there's there's now some baggage that comes along with that for various reasons. Maybe there was a bad version of a form-based code that was written for part of a city that we see sometimes, or you know, maybe people pushing for the wrong kind of development have started using that term. And so it's affiliated with, you know, at a scale development or the type of development that a community doesn't want. So I say, call it whatever you want. Like, I don't, I don't care. You can call it place-based zoning. You can call it just zoning, whatever you want. Um, but what's most important is that a colleague of mine said this, and I thought it was brilliant. He said, form-based coding is not about a final product. It's about a methodology of, of studying the place, studying the patterns, and writing a set of standards that deliver a predictable form related to that understanding. It's a, it's a, what, it, what it looks like in the end is not, not the most important. It's that process of getting to that final product. And I thought that was just brilliant. David Sargent was his name. And because people get caught up in, oh, it needs to look a certain way. It needs these pretty graphics. And I think we're partly uh, the reason for that. Um, because we established that best practice standard, you know, a while ago. But like, it's more important that you, you use that that methodology of understanding a place and and taking, you know, existing lot sizes, fifty foot wide, sixty foot wide, thirty feet wide, one hundred twenty foot deep. Take the top ten lot sizes, and actually study the design of what you want. Run the pro forma analysis. And then sort of back into the right standards based on that is, is kind of what, the way we approach it. I, I like that. And so some cities actually do kind of a form of based approach in certain districts and talking about historic districts. That makes sense. Um, let's see. Uh, there were a couple of questions about so we, you know, we now you're familiar with the House bill, and um, I sent you uh, the draft uh, code language that Bend is considering. There were a number of questions about, well, developers will do the minimum. Are there incentives or programs that you're aware of to take people um, to allow or encourage people to do more, but also while keeping that attainable price point, which in my understanding of what you're saying has an awful lot to do with the actual size of the unit. That's why a fourplex is more attainable than two, four single family homes. So. Yeah, so it's, it's. Um, I mean, I think ideally the incentive is in base regulations, right? Um, in terms of uh, sort of attainability to a middle income household. Now, right there are, um, tools that we've studied that make the entitlement process a little bit more complex. But like in Austin, um, we introduced missing middle housing density bonus um, at the start of that process, which said, which was interesting because unlike like here in California, if you get a density bonus, your building gets bigger, right? You allow the building to get bigger, which is pretty unpredictable. In Austin, we said, well, what if it was to that slide I showed, what if we say this is still the maximum size of your building but instead of the four units that the base zoning allows, what if you're allowed to do eight smaller units? But if you're if you do that, by the way, you need you know a certain percentage of those additional units to meet a certain price point or or a targeted median income. And I will say that um, if you look at Austin's affordable housing uh, toolkit now, it got a little bit more complex than I would have liked. Uh, but it's not a bad uh, uh, sort of system to look at. But you, you also have to be really cautious because when you're talking about a, a triplex or a fourplex and you add further complexity to the entitlement, you're, you're really compromising the feasibility or like the willingness of, hey, the builder who is, is adding stories to a single family house now is likely going to be the one that sort of will probably build the fourplex or the triplex. So you want to encourage that type of builder to sort of have the incentive to do this. So you just have to be really thoughtful about not adding, making it more complex, more risky, and more uncertainty. And um, so I think that's that's really important to think about. Can I answer one question that seems to have come up a couple of times related to, because I think this is one of the points that that's really important to take away is the question was, am I saying that it's better to have four units in a single structure 
versus four units detached on a lot? And what I would say is yes. Um, unless it's even better to allow six or eight one story 500 detached units and get a cottage court. Um, it's just as good, I guess, but by allowing four full size detached units on a lot, you're, you're, you're going to miss attainability. And I think the results, if you allow the third story in particular, are going to be undesirable um, for, for many people. So. so one of the questions was, why does that affect attainability? Um, because the units are bigger. So they're just inherently more expensive. You, you can't deliver them mostly just because of the size. You can't, you know, it's driven by the footprint of the, the parking below it, and it's just extruded up to three stories. Now, could somebody get creative and do a two-story version of it? Sure, but right, there's an incentive in a, in a system that says, hey, developer, you're allowed to do three units. There's an incentive to deliver three of the biggest units that the market will buy or rent, right? And so uh, that's, you're going to get three big units or four big units, and because they're bigger, they're not going to be attainable. Um, and we've seen that all over the country. And, and um, uh, that's why I was partly recommending is, and I, I don't even know if this is legal in Oregon, but like, hey, why don't say if a unit's smaller than 750 square feet, or maybe it's a thousand square feet, it counts as half a unit. Then all of a sudden you could encourage that, that bungalow court with the one story 750 square foot units where there's six or eight of them on a lot. And it's actually the impact in terms of visual impact is less than four detached single family houses that are three stories. So those are the sort of nuances that we're often thinking about that I think are really getting lost in a lot of these applications. And I think it's, that's like I said earlier, I'm worried that those nuances are important and that they're gonna deliver bad results. Um, and, and it's gonna push, it's gonna create this tremendous pushback against missing middle, which it will be really unfortunate. Um, there's, there's a number of questions, um, and I'll see if I can kind of um, capture, about mixed use, either in buildings, in the same building, or in neighborhoods. How important is it for this housing type that we're talking about to be in a walkable uh, neighborhood, to have access, easy access to commercial services? I, I think it's really important. I mean, it's not that you couldn't build a fourplex out in the middle of a suburban subdivision, but it, um, number one, is going to attract a different kind of renter or buyer. Um, and it's just not going to generate as much. Um, it, it's just not the, it's not the best place. Um, so that's why we put walkable neighborhoods in the definition, because that's the ideal place, whether it be a, an existing neighborhood close to a downtown or close to a neighborhood main street. Um, or a new community with that, those commercial services within walking distance. I think it's really important. Um, like the project in Nebraska that I showed the aerial photo of, most developers and most planners probably would have just created a bunch of missing middle housing types, not created that neighborhood main street. And we told our client, this is critical, especially since you're so isolated. And he, he was skeptical, um, but he believed, he trusted us and he built the main street. And hey, guess what, a pizza shop, and a yoga studio were the first to show up and there's a coffee shop about to move in. And it's just like any, any, any commercial consultant they talk to is like, oh, there's no viability out here. But it, it's really important for delivering the lifestyle that many of the households want and sometimes need um, what like baby boomers, um, uh, that walkability and access is really important. Here, the first thing would have been a brew pub, yeah. Yes, you know that's we're we're working on a little project in um, uh, in in Colorado right now in a town of fifteen thousand square feet, and it's going to have a brew pub, a five thousand square foot brew pub, as an anchor. And I'm just like, this is unheard of to have this anchor tenant like from the start. It's like this, you know. It's so that yeah, it's 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 great to see that local businesses. It's they're they're great incubators, right? And um, you know, it's it's just incubating small businesses is a really another really great aspect of keeping a community really unique and and sort of supporting those small businesses. So one more set of questions, which may not be in your um, 
court at all, Dan, but I'm going to ask you, which is in Oregon, um, and, and especially in Bend, we, do, we use system development charges to pay for a lot of transportation pay, transportation infrastructure. And they're, they're done um, by capita, not on square footage, or even they're kind of done on, on trip calcs. There's that. Um, and do you see a correlation, maybe an incentive or any way to work around uh, system development charges and missing middle housing? So it's per unit, it's done on a per unit basis. Is that the way that it's done? Be because what I would say is that um, if, if those sorts of fees are done on a per unit basis, regardless of unit size, it's a huge disincentive for the delivery of smaller, more affordable units. So. Absolutely, those fees need to be calibrated based on unit size. We've seen that specifically here in California on a couple of different pocket neighborhood projects we were working on where a client wanted to deliver 650 square foot cottages, but when they realized that their impact fees were $60,000 per unit, like it didn't pencil out. And so they became 2,500 square foot houses. And that's not anybody's intent. Um, you know, for those fees. And so I think they're definitely, you know, it's funny because I almost had to put a slide in that, but I, I, I didn't this time, but it's, it's, it's super important to adjust those, those fees based on unit size. So you're not disincentivizing, you know, one of the many disincentives for a smaller, more affordable unit. Um, and I know there's a question about snow, um, snow removal and parking on street parking. Just one of the many battles you have to, in conversations you have to have. I understand we work in a lot of environments that have a lot of snow, including Steamboat Springs, um, Colorado, that has a tremendous amount of snow, Flagstaff, Arizona. And I understand that a lot of places either remove on street parking in the winters completely or sort of, you know, do it from side to side every week. Um, you just need to understand, at, at the very least, you need at least one side to, to function as on-street parking, even in the winters. And I don't know, I think we're smart enough to actually figure out a way to, to allow on-street parking and, and still still deliver snow removal. I, I don't think it's rocket science, but um, it's just a, it's a tough conversation and a technical conversation that, that needs to happen in communities that have a lot of snow, uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, have you worked at all with, uh, so, so the question was about solar plant panels, but also I'd be, I would go to passive solar, um, fitting in with missing middle housing and, and higher density and smaller units. So, um, yeah, I think it's, there's no reason that you can't integrate it. Uh, what I would say is um, most of our clients are like breaking so many molds um, just to do a missing middle project that solar is like one step they're not quite comfortable with yet, which but we are doing a really great 20 unit courtyard apartment building in Santa Maria, California. And actually based on state requirements, it's gonna have solar panels. You know, it's gonna be fully fully solar, um, which is super exciting. And um, I, I'm all for it. Yeah, I think, I think we need to be pushing on green buildings. And one of my colleagues, Doug Farr, who you might know Farr and Associates, uh, who a, a, has a real expertise in, in green building and has even written a couple of books on it, like did an overlay of the missing middle diagram that I should pull out that had had solar um, solar installation on all the missing middle buildings. So I think it's an important part of it. And I think um, energy, sort of the fact that missing middle buildings use less energy is an important part of that conversation. And um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm completely for sort of making sure that green building is, a, is an important part of the missing middle discussion for sure. So one final question, because it kind of makes me laugh. And I think you've already answered it by talking about what you did with your garage. But someone is asking, without garages in smaller units, where do people store all their stuff? And that's spelled in all caps, um, which is, you know, um, I mean, I, I know lots and lots of people whose garages are not used for cars. They're used for their canoes and their bicycles, <laughs> you know, and all their stuff. So. Um, I'm sure I'm sure you get asked that a lot. I mean, part of it is just, uh, not maybe to have so much stuff, but well, I yeah, but I think part of it's just like when we're designing a new missing middle project, whether it be a one acre, five acre site, you know, it's it's we are thoughtful about accommodating um, out of sort of detached storage spaces for that specific reason. Um, so it's it's definitely need to be thoughtful about it, um, but I will say that part of it is just like living a little bit smaller, as as well. Um, 
uh, uh, sort of a media my chuckle on on top of that question related to my my little half half garage is I had to move everything out of my half garage into a storage unit to use it as my home office this past year. Because <laughs> you can imagine living in a thousand square foot house with two kids in school remotely and two adults working remotely is uh, I needed to find that space. But um, you know, I'm I'm happy to say that my my hometown here, Berkeley, actually unanimously approved the removal of off street, all off street parking requirements just four weeks ago and also unanimously approved um, the exploration of allowing three to four units on all lots citywide. And so we're moving in a, I think, really great direction. And um, uh, like I said, you know, there's, there's gonna be some lessons learned. Um, we're gonna do some things right, we're gonna do some things a little bit wrong, but I think we just need to adjust along the way and um, just make sure we are being thoughtful because like I said, it's the worst case scenario is we get this tremendous backlash uh, of the application of missing middle like we did in the seventies when we delivered a lot of really bad infill housing. Uh, it was partly the, uh, a product of that era of architecture and, and, and site planning, but um, you know, just, just being really thoughtful and, and just continuing the message is that missing middle is not just about more units on a lot, it's about being thoughtful about the form and scale of those units is, is super important. Well, we've gone about 15 minutes over. Thank you so much for being patient. I think um, there are probably more questions that I didn't get to, but Dan, I hope next time you're in person. So, so come on yeah, back to the too. All I right. Do too. All Thanks, right. Karen, and thank, thank you. Thanks thank to everybody. building a better band. Thank you, everybody.